Good evening, everybody. Please stand with me and turn in your hymnals to hymn number 57. Hymn number 57 at Calvary. We'll sing the first and the last. We'll sing the first and the last. the Lord. Well, good to see you tonight. Amen. It's been great and praise the Lord good to be here. All right. Well, we're going to look forward to a great night together as we uh, really, uh, God speaks to our heart and he speaks to us about our Bibles. Um, Mallory showed me her Bible, uh, old Bible. It's from 1906. And, um, you know, it doesn't say on here what version it is. Right. You know why? Right. That's the word, right? Yeah, it's like that's what it was, and now that ought to tell you something that, you know, and I uh, appreciate Brother Stringer just helping us to learn that and understand that, so um, let's go to the Lord prayer. Father, we're grateful to be in your house today, and God, thank you for letting us be here. God, thank you for the Bible, and we ask your blessing upon uh, Brother Stringer, and, and Lord, as we kind of rush in and, and a lot of things done today, Lord, please help us to leave that. Um, leave that uh, at home and God uh, make all the trouble to get here and I thank you for the folks that have and and uh, maybe uh, rush down some dinner maybe skip dinner to be here tonight uh, but Lord help us to just clear our minds and our hearts and and uh, Lord help us to hear from you tonight please in Jesus name we pray amen thank you, you maybe see you. Please stand with me again. <laughs> Turn to hymn number 145. I love to tell the story. Hymn number 145. We'll sing the first and the last. Thank you for praying for Mrs. Jackson. Uh, the surger surgery went well. She wanted to be here tonight, and I said I prayed with her before she went in, and 
And I said, well, let's just see how it goes. And uh, so she's recovering from that. Um, uh, Ms. Bartron had her, uh, what, what she was having was a uh, bone marrow test, uh, see if her cancer's in her bones. So um, just continue to pray for her. Thank you for praying for Brother Dove's family. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was very, very powerful testimony she had. And, uh, but, you know, it's still tough when you see you know, dad holding two kids and looking at mom in the casket, but um, but he gave a tremendous testimony of her love for the Lord, and so many other people did too, and uh, so just makes the promises of heaven even sweeter, amen. So, all right, well, uh, Brother John's going to lead us in prayer as we receive the offering tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do, Lord, we we thank you for uh, the tithes and offerings, Lord, that we're going to be able to give you. Lord, thanks for always providing for us, Lord. Be with the Dove family, um, Lord, and be with the special tonight. And thank you for going to give us the pastor as well. Lord, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Just real quick, uh, we do have a lot of Easter flyers, so we'd like you to take those and just pass them out everywhere you go, or maybe you leave some in the post office, you could leave a stack there and um, go back the next day, they throw them away, put another stack. Um, but they usually leave them there, they don't mind, uh, but just take them to work, leave them out. Um, I, uh, you know, I ask if, uh, they're, if they're taking their kids to an Easter egg hunt anywhere. You know, the one they had last week for the county kind of got messed up. It rained, and there was no candy in the eggs, and so there was lots of disappointed people say, hey, ours got candy, and all you got to do is register. And uh, so uh, so last week was a bust with the county. So, so I asked the guy to, today, I said, hey, uh, um, you know, want to invite you out for Easter into our church, gave him a track, and I said, hey, you got any kids? And he goes, yeah, a little girl. And uh, I said, well, would you like to have her come to the Easter egg hunt? And uh, he said, well, she's kind of little, but we wanted to. And I said, how old is she? And he said, a year and a half. I said, that's the same age as my granddaughter. She's coming. And so we're going to have a section for the little kids like that, right? Zero to three. Zero to three, and then the primary Nine to twelve, so uh, so you can let folks so you know because sometimes they don't want to bring them to get trampled. They said, no, 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 you can bring your little kids. So, yeah, so uh, use the flyers up, please, please, please. Um, so just for a reminder, did that. All right, well, uh, again, it's been just a wonderful, wonderful uh, couple days, and I appreciate Brother uh, Stringer being with us. And uh, so let me pray, and then we're gonna have a special in song, and then uh, then he's gonna come up. Okay, Father, we sure love you, and thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, uh, just a man like Brother Stringer, and Lord, there just seems like there aren't many, and so we're very, very thankful for him and, and for his heart for you, and God, we just pray that you'd uh, just give him strength and clarity of thought, and, and the Lord, just fill him with thy spirit tonight, and give us ears to hear, and bless now as this uh, special song is offered to you that it would be uh, honoring and 
and that you be pleased. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. happened to a nation that used to fear the Lord, to a people whose foundation was built upon God's word. We've allowed the world's opinion to chart a different way, but it's time the church of Jesus Christ should boldly stand and say God's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans God's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to courthouse walls, remove it from the schools, teach our children that we're animals, speak against the golden rule, try and hide our Christian heritage from the public eye, but they'll never overcome God's word, no matter how they try. Good evening. Boy, it's good to see you all here. Good to see such a wonderful group of young people here. The uh, message for tonight is the toughest one I ever bring on this subject. I'm not trying to be tough on purpose. It is the hardest one to understand and come to grips with. And in, in many ways, the most important. When you get this, all of this just comes together. I thank you. That was distracting to me. I appreciate that. And um, uh, it's important for us to get. Would you go to 1 John chapter 4 with me? First half of the message might not seem like it's about the King James Bible, but if you'll hang on with me. 
It will be. 1 John chapter 4 explains to us where false religion comes from. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out to the world. If I could trouble you all for a bottle of water, I'd be grateful. <coughs> Excuse me. It should be, but I don't... Oh, there's a bunch of... All the way in the back. If you get down on your knees and roll around for a while, you can find, find the water. Thank you so much. I'm glad they don't believe in baptism by sprinkling. They can never find the water. <clears throat> Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out to the world. This is where false religion comes from. You ready? From Satan to evil spirits to false prophets to unsuspecting followers. I'm not saying the folks that follow this know what they're doing. I will tell you the false prophets that initiate these things know what they're doing. Obviously the evil spirits know what they're doing. And if you take notes of any kind or you just got a good memory, if you get a handle on this, it'll help you see a lot of situations. False theology comes from Satan to evil spirits. Okay, Satan to evil spirits, from evil spirits to false prophets. From false prophets to unsuspecting followers. Right? It's important. So uh, how, how, do, how do you know you're dealing with false spirits? Verse 2, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, where ye have heard that it should come, even now is it already in the world. A story to deal with every religion, you want to ask, where did this religion come from? Where did the teaching come from? Where did the ideas come from? Where did the theology come from? For example, Islam. Islam begins, according to Muhammad, he marries a widow who owned a caravan route that went between two cities in the Arabian Peninsula. It was a two-day trip. He becomes responsible for the caravan route. They would stop overnight at a little oasis with a small cave. He would stay in the cave. And according to Muhammad, spirits began to appear to him. And those spirits claimed they were angels. And the angels told Muhammad that the truth had been lost on the earth since the first century, but God had chosen him to be the man that would restore the truth, and the spirits would then give him revelations that resulted in the Quran. And in the Quran, the spirits taught him that while Jesus Christ was a great prophet, he was not God in the flesh. And taught him that you specifically that you should never trust the blood uh, idea of a blood atonement for man's sin. Out of that spirit revelation came Islam. Now, when a person tells you a story like the story that Muhammad told, there are three possibilities. One, he's a con artist. Because angels don't give a message like that. Or he could be insane. Insane people hear things that don't actually happen. Or a demon came to him, lied to him, and pretended to be an angel and gave him that message about not trusting Christ. Those are the three possibilities. But by the way, you think Satan is smart enough to figure out how to mislead people? And so there you are, and there's the test. Muhammad himself, by his own account, when this first began to happen, he was afraid the spirits he was talking to were demons who were trying to fool him. He went back and spoke to his mother, and he, uh, not his mother, but his wife, and his uncle and, and about this. And they said, oh, no, no, that's angels. God has chosen you for something special. And so he relaxed and began to trust those spirits. That is how we have the scourge of Islam in our world today. You can go on with this. 
take religion after religion, false religion after false religion after false religion. The Mormons. Joseph Smith. Kind of a small town con artist. But according to Joseph Smith, one day he's walking in the woods and an angel appears to him. And that angel tells Joseph Smith, the truth has been lost on the earth since the first century. But that God's finally found someone whose sincerity of purpose he could trust in order to restore the truth. And leads to supposedly the, uh, giving him these golden plates and out of the golden plates comes the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon will tell you clearly Jesus is not God. I mean, they'll use the word God, small g, because they believe all good men can become gods, but he's clearly not God in the flesh. He's just God the same way we could all be God. And the Book of Mormon very clearly identifies the idea of the blood atonement as some heresy that you should not trust. Salvation is distinctly by works. Then when a guy tells you a story, like the one Moses Smith tells, there are three possibilities. Okay. He made it up. Or he's crazy. But he was able to administrate an ever-growing movement. Crazy people are usually off in the corner by themselves. Or a demon spoke to him, said, I'm the angel Moroni, and gave him all this false information. You understand? You cannot get a character reference on a demon. They lie. And the Bible refers to them as gods and as devils. And... Um, Sometimes spirits will come and they'll tell people, I am a god of such and such. Sometimes spirits will come and say, I'm a being from another planet. Sometimes spirits will come and say, I'm a ghost. But they're lying. They're demons. Jehovah's Witness. A fellow named Charles Taz Russell was teaching Sunday school in a congregational church. He came to the conclusion that hell was not real. He began to teach that in the adult Sunday school class. Church board called him in, said that's not, we don't believe that's the Bible. That's not the doctrinal statement of our church. You can't teach this. They removed him from being the Sunday school teacher. He got angry, said he would never go back to church. And, and so uh, he would sit, in, according to him, he would sit in his study and read the Bible on Sunday mornings that, instead of going to church. And then one day, according to Charles, Charles Taz Russell, he heard, literally, audibly heard the voice of God. He heard a voice. So that voice was speaking to him. And um, a voice began to tell him. Truth had been lost on the earth since the first century. But God had finally found someone worthy of being the one that would restore the truth. And of course it happened to be Charles Taz Russell. And the spirit, or the voice of God, if a person says they've audibly heard the voice of God, there are three possibilities. Made it up. They're crazy. Or a demon spoke to them and said, this is the voice of God. Okay? My challenge for Jehovah's Witnesses, how do you know who that voice was? I could go on and on and on. I just a couple weeks ago, I taught a class on cults at the college, and we just went through this again and again and again. You name the movement, it'll have a story like that. And the Bible specifically tells us when there is spirit contact, there is a test that we're supposed to give that to. Okay? And that makes all the difference in the world, that test. Muhammad failed that test. Bob Jones Sr. told the story about being as a teenage boy, full-time evangelist. He's preaching in tent meetings all over the South. And he's preaching in Alabama. His mother had passed away. And there he is in Alabama. And he said, there's a medium giving seances in a tent at one end of the town. And he's preaching at an evangelistic meeting in a tent at the other end of town. So one night, he was curious what they were doing in the medium's tent. His service was over. Theirs was still going on. So he just slipped down and went in the tent, just thinking he'd watch. So he got in there sitting in the back, and the medium was on a platform and with a table. And she said, 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a distinguished visitor here with us tonight. Evangelist Bob Jones is here. She said, I'd like to ask him to come up on the platform and tell me who he would like to speak to from beyond. And I will bring up anybody he wishes to speak to. He thought it was nonsense and he would go up and nothing would happen. He went up and sat at the table. And in, by his own testimony, a white shadowy shape like nothing he'd ever seen before appeared over that table. And began to speak to him with a voice that sounded identical to the voice of his mom. By, by the way, don't be shocked if demons can imitate voices. There are people who can imitate voices. Okay? There's one young preacher in the Philippines can imitate me exactly and cracks up everybody. Sometimes I'll have him up to speak just a little bit before I preach and it breaks everybody up. And Bob Jones was, was stunned and confused. And he said, Mother, what's it like to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus? And then the voice said, oh, when you get on this side, you discover that Jesus was just another man. And Bob Jones stood up, pointed to the shape and said, you're not my mother, you're a lying demon from hell. He passed the test. Okay? Try the spirits. Now, you can go through, and like I said, I just taught a class on cults, went through cult after cult after cult. This is the spirit story about how they were started. There's always a story like this, even if you're not as likely to know it. I had a group of people call me one time. They were very concerned. Small town in Indiana, and in their town, somebody bought a house right across the street from the public high school. And every day as school let out, he had this house open, and he had put in foosball and ping pong and a pool table and uh, ice hockey, or yeah, ice hockey, air hockey, and he had food, and he would welcome the kids to come in, and he would sit and have religious studies with them. And people were kind of freaked out about what the kids were coming home telling their parents. And so they wanted to know if I, they thought he was a new age te movement teacher. They wanted to know if I would be willing to come and debate him in front of the kids about the new age movement. So they scheduled it. I said, okay, I will. I showed up. We got about 200 people for the debate. I thought, meet him about five minutes before it's supposed to start. Found out he's not a new age movement teacher. I'm about to debate him in front of a crowd. I don't have the faintest idea what his group is all about. They're called the Faithists. I've never heard of them before. So the debate starts, and we have rules, and we're going back and forth. He speaks three minutes. I speak three minutes, so forth. Go back and forth. And, and so I just have, have the one question. Tell me where your information comes from. Oh, it comes from the new Bible, the book of God, Oashbi. Okay. Tell me where Oashbi comes from. He didn't want to answer that question. So it doesn't matter. It's, you know, the book of God. Yes, it does. How, why should we believe it's the book of God? What's the origin of your teaching? Where do your ideas come from? What is this about? So finally, after I badgered him enough, I said, well, Oashbi, it's an 1,100-page book. I had never heard of it. I had even trouble finding a copy after it was over. I finally found one on the Internet for $1,000, and I just didn't want it that bad. But um, in the eight, late 1800s, there's a man named John Newborough. Never heard of him before or since. But there was a man named John Newborough in England, and according to Mr. Newborough, angels would come and possess his body. Mm -hmm. And the angels typed out through his fingers a new Bible. 1,100 pages. I said, and when I told that story, I said, thank you, sir. Now, I just have one more question. What does Oashpi say about Jesus Christ? He didn't want to answer that one either. I pressed him enough. He finally had to answer. He says, well, the angels told him that when you get on the other side, you realize Jesus is one of the leading great angels, but he's not God. That's it. Thank you, sir. That's all I need to know. There's a test in 1 John chapter 4. Try the spirits. And then when a guy tells you a story about how the angels came and took over his body and typed this out through him, there are three possibilities. Okay? He could be making it up because he's a con artist. Or he could be crazy. Or 
a demon took him over, and the demon said he was an angel. You all got it? There are three possibilities when people have these stories of spirit revelation. And when you get them, you have the key to understanding the origin of any false religion. Some of them are very open about their stories, some not. About 30, 40 years ago, a fellow named Victor Paul Willwill up in Chicago. He graduated from a good Bible college, a good at the time, and Bible college, but after he was out pastoring, he said he began to have new revelations from God, that he began to hear the voice of God, and the voice of God led him to start his own cult, the way, like that. There are three possibilities. Say, well, I, I thought this was a King James conference. It is. Boy, I came across this information a piece at a time because I'm often speaking on this and people broadcast in one form or another my messages. I came across the story of Westcott and Hort, the two men we talked about yesterday. Church of England preachers. I heard that Arthur Westcott had written the biography of his father and that uh, Arthur Hort had written the biography of his father and that there was some interesting information in those biographies. Those two men, when they were in college, started a club that was called the Ghostly Guild. The purpose of the club was to go out and investigate stories about ghosts and decide which ones were real and which ones were not. That would go on and become the largest occult organization in England, still exists today, the largest occult organization in England. That's quite a pedigree to have started something like that. And now they're supportive. See, they were young. They were college kids. College kids do stupid things. Well, well, let me be clear. I've been around college kids nonstop. And yeah, sometimes they do crazy things. But um, I've never met any that accidentally started a worldwide occult organization. But let's just give them a break. And we won't even count that one against them. Because after they graduated and they became preachers in the Church of England, they would, with a group of other people, start a second occult organization, and then later a third called the Apostles, 12 people, including them. But in all three of these, there was communication with ghosts, they said. And then somebody tells you, well, anyway. And Arthur... By the way, a lot of folks around and say, well, those books don't exist. Uh, people just made that up. It's not real. And, and I went through wondering about that. I heard about those books. I, I, I got on books in print because I wanted to try and order them. Couldn't find them. People say they don't exist. People check the books aren't real. And, and I mentioned to somebody I can't find them. And they said, Phil, that's books of print in the United States. These men were in England. Where do you think the books were written? And I checked. And I ordered them out of a service in England, and I have the books. I've seen them. I've seen them so recently. I was sending out an email to answer a question about them right before we left for the airport on Saturday. The books aren't even back on the shelf. They're on my desk. They're real. And in Arthur Westcott, both books, both those men, according to their sons, believed in what's called the communion of the saints. The communion of the saints is a belief that when people die, their spirits do not go out to eternity right away. They hang around the earth for a period of time. It's a serious teaching. There's a whole cult built around it called Anthrosophy. When I was pastoring in Chicago, we were surrounded in four directions by apartment buildings. Okay? And about two blocks down from the church, there was a little thing called a little white frame building that had a sign that said, Community Christian Church. Well, that sounded interesting. Didn't really know what it was. One day I was out with the assistant pastor and, and we saw a guy going in that looked dressed like he might be a pastor and we stopped, we introduced ourselves and, and told him, said, we're, we're from the church down a couple blocks. And he goes, oh, he goes, I know exactly where your church is. He said, the apartment building to the north is our international seminary. Oh, really? Didn't have a sign? He said, yeah, he said, we bring young people from all over the world there to train for the ministry. And then went on to explain they believe in the communion of the saints and that they practice ministering to people's spirits before they're born, while they're alive, 
and after they're dead. And they said, when we start a service on Sunday morning, the spirits of those not yet born will come and be in the service with us, and the spirits of the recent dead will come and be in the service with us, and all three of us worship God together. And we bring young people in to train them in all that. No. When a guy tells you a story like that, turns out there are three possibilities. So I, I, I was intrigued, of course, and I, I looked them up on the Internet and found out about their particular group. And sure enough, they practice the communion of the saints. And uh, never forget, they're college-age young people. We're having a revival meeting, and, and it's about half hour before church starts, and, and I'm out in the parking lot of the church. And some of the young ladies, college-age young ladies, that were in this group are out in the little lawn in front of the apartment building. A couple of my young men came up and said, Pastor, would you have anything wrong with us going and inviting them to church? I said, your zealous desire to reach attractive young women for Christ is very commendable. I didn't tell him anything about who they were. I said, it's always fine to go out and invite somebody to revival meeting. So they went across to talk to those girls. They came back a few minutes later. Their eyes were as wide as saucers. So you wouldn't believe what they said. Yes, I would, really. <laughs> but Westcott and Hort's sons said their fathers practiced the communion of saints. They couldn't say that openly while they were Church of England preachers. According to Westcott's son, his father, during the time that they were doing their Greek New Testament and their English translation, would go to the chapel of the church he pastored at night in the dark about midnight, he would sit in the auditorium with no lights on. And as he sat, one spirit would come and minister with him. Another spirit would come and minister to him. Another, until the 400-seat auditorium was full. And they would minister together for hours. And as light came, one by one, the spirits would leave. And when they left, he would come over, get his breakfast, and he would sleep during the day because he spent all night in the church auditorium in the dark. When a guy tells you a story like that, it turns out there are three possibilities. And I don't care which one is true, I do not trust him to be a Bible translator. If he's a con artist who made it up, I don't trust him with the Bible. If he's crazy, I don't trust him with the Bible. And if he spent the night with 400 spirits, night after night after night, I really don't trust him with the Bible. And you, you all got it? This is serious business. See, every major English translation is entirely, except King James, is entirely or a little bit based on the work of Westcott and Hort. Do you trust them handling the Bible? And, and when I was talking about this in a message, and I point out that I've got a book called Communicating with the Spirits, and it's the story of a Catholic priest in Germany in the 1930s. He got kicked out of the Catholic Church because he began to get up and preach to his people that on a routine basis, spirits came and communicated with him, and those spirits taught him, and the spirits told him indeed that Jesus was not God and they should not think Jesus was God. The spirits told him that the idea of a blood atonement was heresy. And the spirits told him, according to him, that no matter what you do, never, ever, ever trust a translation of the Bible from the received text. The Lutheran Bible is from the received text. And Catholics kicked him out. And so I told that story, and somebody heard it, and they got a hold of me, and they said, Brother Stringer, you don't know the rest of the Greber, Johann Greber. You don't know the rest of the Greber story, do you? I said, apparently not. He said, they said, he moved to the United States after he got expelled as a priest. He came to the United States, and he translated the Bible into English. And that Bible today is published by the Spiritualist Church, and it's their official Bible. So I called Spiritualist Church in Flint, Michigan. Yeah, they sell those Bibles. I ordered one. I got it sent to me. Boy, it was a revelation. In the opening chapter, it says the very spirits that had spoke to him in Germany came to the United States 
and they dictated to him word for word the proper translation of this Bible. Now, you never guess what the Bible, his Bible says about Christ. He was not the God in John 1. He was a God. And in 1 John 4, it doesn't say try the spirits. In that Bible in 1 John 4, it says trust the spirits. There's a shocker, isn't it? And you can guess how, how plan of salvation and so forth has changed in that Bible. It is still the Bible of the spiritualist church today and still influential. You see, Satan's clever enough to figure out if he can put something in front of people that they think is the Bible, that it has the wrong information in it, they will be persuaded. So I mentioned that. And again, a different person gets told me, says, you don't know the rest of the Greber story, do you? Apparently not. They said, did you know that when the Jehovah's Witness translators translated the New World Translation, they had the Greber Bible in front of them as a guide and that they took their heretical translation of John chapter 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was a God. Word for word from Greber. So I looked that up and sure enough, that was influential in the Jehovah's Witness translation of the Bible. Boy, when I was in Bible college, I worked at a public library. It was just a 10-minute walk from the college, and, and I they had trouble parking there, so I'd just park at the college. I'd walk over to the library, work there, and walk back to the college and drive home. And uh, that, I had an unusual job. In those days, the state of Indiana had a bizarre law that said libraries could never give away or sell books. If library was done with a book, they had to dispose of it. And they literally, across the street from the main library, they had a burner. And one of my jobs, the librarians would set out the books they wished to discard. I would get a cart. Every day I would go around and pick up the books they wished to discard. I would take them across the street, and I would burn them in the burner I worked my way through college as a book burner. Now, strange thing, every now and then I could find parking over there. And, and when I did, I usually parked near the burner. And somehow, hard to explain, but somehow some of those books fell into my car as I was <laughs> making my way to burn. One of the books that accidentally fell into my car was called Ring of Truth by J.B. Phillips. Phillips was a man who translated the New Testament into English. For a little while, it was a prominent translation. Bill Gothard was using it in the notes in his institutes for years. And he wrote a book about his experience as a translator called Ring of Truth. That book sat on my shelf for decades. Finally, as I began to deal more and more with these things, I said, I should probably read that. I pull it out, I read it. And in one chapter, he tells this story. said he'd written the noted linguist, literary man, C.S. Lewis. He asked him a question about how he should translate a particular verse. But he said Lewis died before he could answer the letter. But, he said, Lewis was not comfortable going on to heaven with his correspondence unanswered. So according to J.B. Phillips, one evening when he was working on his Bible translation, the ghost of C.S. Lewis appeared in his study for the purpose of answering his question about Bible translation. What a gentleman that C.S. Lewis was. When a guy tells you a story like that, you might be able to figure this out. There are three possibilities. Either J.B. Phillips respected a uh, university professor was a con artist, or he was insane, or a spirit appeared to him and told him he was C.S. Lewis and helped him figure out Bible translation. He does not tell us, I wish he did, what passage they were discussing, but I will tell you that if you get a Phillips translation, it is extraordinarily weak on the deity of Christ. What a shock. So I told that story. And somebody said, Brother Stringer, have you ever read the story of Joseph Smith's Bible translation? 
No, but I, I, I looked it up. I found it. I ordered the Joseph Smith New Testament. And in the opening chapter, Joseph Smith tells a story how he and another man, that spirits came to them and talked to them about how to translate the New Testament. They gave them words that were not in any Greek manuscript anywhere and told them not to use words that were well established in the received text. And, and the spirits warned them about not looking to the received text, the majority text, for any information. And, and, and of course, if you look in their translation, very clear. What a shock. So I'm, I'm telling those stories. And somebody said, Brother Stringer, are you familiar with Virginia Mollencott? Well, I am. She was one of the key people in the New International Version translation. She is the one I mentioned last night. She graduated from a Christian school, went to a fundamentalist university, got a, graduated, got a master's degree, got married, taught at that university. Then she and her husband went to teach at another fundamentalist university. And then, in her, her phrase, she got set free from the King James Bible. When she got set free from the King James Bible, she discovered she was a lesbian. She divorced her husband and began to live with a woman. And she wrote several books about how the whole Christian conception of criticizing homosexuality was based on mistranslations in the King James Bible. And I had read one of those books by somebody said, well, you know, she's got another book called Sensuous Spirituality. See, it might interest you. And I read it, and she tells the story, how that after she got set from the King James Bible and publicly admitted she was a lesbian, she began to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit audibly. Not only did she hear the voice of the Holy Spirit audibly, Angels began to appear to her and speak to her audibly. And then, quote, a multitude of other spirits began to appear to her and speak to her audibly. What exactly are the other spirits? And they began to guide her in all this truth. And she began to discover, she, see, abortion is not wrong because the spirits are already pre-existing. And when you have an abortion, it just means the spirit that would have gone into that body cannot go into that body, but they go into another body, so it's okay. She knows that because the spirits of the unborn told her. Y'all know how this works, don't you? When somebody tells you a story like that, there are three possibilities. Do you know how many independent Baptist churches Sunday the pastor was standing in the pulpit with a Bible that she helped to produce? And she learned other things. And of course, she, she learned that God was female. And she learned that, that God is a spirit, uh, created our spirits, but so that we could lead a succession of lives. And she wrote a series of books on all this. She wrote a book called Omnigender. Fascinating book. It is one of the origins of the omnigender revolution today. This, the omnigender book says, this is the will of God for us. This is what we have to come to grips with. You know the spirits tell you this. Said that man should not be limited to two genders. We need to build a culture where it's fl a fluid gender culture where you can be any gender you want to be on any day that you choose absolutely free from the two-gender model. Sound like anything you've heard recently? And she was one of the pioneers of the omnigender theory. And she said, we need to create a culture. And she said, it's going to be hard, but we have to insist that people recognize this. The two-gender model comes from biased Christianity and the weak King James translation. And we have to insist that people abandon that model because if they don't abandon that model, other people can't be free. And she writes in Omni, the book Omnigender that she believes that when you deal with a, tra a, a homosexual or a lesbian or a transgender person or any of a number of other categories, that those people are who they are and they do what they do because they have gods living inside them. 
Boy, when a person tells you a story like that. And she goes on to propose this whole culture that today is being imposed on our society. By the way, our president wrote an introduction to Buck six years ago that omnigender people or transgender people were the bravest and noblest Americans. He has repeated that several times publicly, including last week. Our vice president has said the same thing using the exact same words. So as our press secretary. And that is the position of an entire political party today. Whether anybody wants to be comfortable with that or not, that's just what's there. You trace it back to, and there's others besides Virginia Mollencott, she was the Bible translator in a group, to a handful of women who all claim to be evangelicals and teach evangelical religion, and they've written books demanding the omnigender revolution because, after all, these people are unique, they're the bravest, they're the most honorable people we have, they have gods indwelling them. You really comfortable with the Bible that she helped word? But it's all over the place in independent Baptist churches. Now, let me go back to the beginning. Where's false theology come from? Satan. Two evil spirits. We're supposed to try the spirits. It goes from the spirits to false prophets, men who are willing to be used in that way. And it goes from them to unsuspecting followers who do not know they're following something satanic and demonic. Well, I'm about to say next, really important. Do not rush out here and tell your friend carrying an NIV that they're carrying a satanic Bible. They will not be able to understand you. They literally will not be capable of processing that and coming to grips with it. Better to ask them where it comes from and what they know about the translators and work your way into it. But do not run out and give people information they can't handle. This is never the first message I preach in a King James conference. For a reason. I build a basis for it. I'm not trying to hurt people. I'm not trying to create problems for people. But we need to understand this. And think with me for a minute. If there's a Satan, and we would all agree from the Bible there is. And he's clever. I think we would expect that. Look how he fooled Eve. I could say look at the times he's fooled you, but we'll just move on. Could you think of a more clever way to sidetrack Christianity than to put something that was marred by spirit contact and influence in front of people and tell them it's the Bible? Now, I want you to watch this. People who've grown up on a King James Bible, and you put an ESV, you put an NIV, you put Holman Christian Standard Translation in front of them. They read it, and they interpret it in the light of the way they were trained on the King James. So they say, I don't see all this stuff there. That, that's because you had something planted in you. What happens to the next generation that did not have that implanted? We're seeing things right now in fundamentalist and independent Baptist circles you would never have dreamed of a few years ago. You're seeing Bible colleges admit homosexual students and defend them. So where did we get all that? They've been using the wrong Bibles. Don't tell me it doesn't matter which Bible you use. It matters big time which Bible you use. Where did they get all this we can, anything goes? Well, if we don't have an authoritative Bible then wouldn't anything be okay? But if we have an authoritative Bible that makes up for our own lack of understanding and information, and that Bible tells us, and among other things, it tells us to try the spirits. And I've got a Bible that has been influenced by spirit contact on Westcott and Hort. I should be asking questions about that. 
this extraordinarily serious thing. So you saying all these other Bibles are a satanic plot to deceive people about the truth of Christianity? Yeah, I really am. That's not the first thing I would tell my friend that's carrying an ESV. I would wait if I ever brought it up till I had the right moment in order to make the case. My wife and I went to hear a friend preach recently who's not with us on this. He preaches from the ESV. And uh, went, but we went just to be friendly and supportive. And we went, he's preaching this passage and it's open to the ESV. And what he preached was good, but it didn't match his text. He grew up on a King James Bible. He had a good sermon outline consistent with the truths that were in the King James Bible. And he didn't even get it. And I'm sitting there, frankly, I'm wanting to laugh, but I don't. But I'm nudging my wife. That's not what he said. What he said he got from growing up with the King James Bible. And his mind, when he reads that and the ESV says something different, his mind goes back to that which he was taught as a child. So he didn't get it. If you tried to tell him that passage you just preached from is wrong. Your sermon was right. But the passage you just preached from was wrong. He wouldn't understand what you were saying. I'm telling you, Satan is extremely clever. Since I've been preaching about this, folks have bombarded me with other pieces of information. Manly Hall, leading Mason. And the high rank where, the, where they look and practice the occult. And Manly Hall writes and says, if we could ever get rid of the King James Bible, we could have the one world religion we want. It's the people using the King James Bible that stand in our way. Madame Blavatsky, founder of Theosophy. Theosophy is a religion that teaches that all the answers in life were found by communicating with spirits, which she began to do when she was young. See, there's seven levels of spirits. And as you go to the first level, they'll help you in these areas of life. And in the second level, those spirits will help you in other areas of life. Third level, those spirits... When you get to the seventh ultimate level, which she has done, one of the things the spirits will tell you Jesus was not God. And the blood atonement is a heresy because salvation is by works. And never, ever, ever trust a Bible from the majority text. Huh? And uh, she recommends, by the way, anything based on Westcott and Hort. So she can be real comfortable because there's a bunch of them based on Westcott and Hort today. I pastoring in Chicago and we had a young lady, Muslim young lady got saved and she's coming to church and uh, we'd given her a Bible but she noticed a lot of our folks had carried black leather reference Bibles. She's a brand new Christian. Okay? She goes into a Christian bookstore for the first time in her life. She doesn't know one version from another but she asked for a black leather reference Bible. They sold one. I don't know what one they sold. But I sold her one. I could see her the next Sunday morning. She's sitting with two girls from the church, one on one side, one on the other side. I'm reading the scripture, and she's looking funny. She looks over. She looks over here. She has this disgusted look on her face. Monday morning, she goes back into the Christian bookstore. She says, you sold me a defective Bible. She says, I either want my money back or one with the real words in it. She did not mention a King James translation. She didn't know anything about that. She just asked for one with the real words in it. You know what they gave her? They gave her a King James Bible when she asked for that. I'm telling you, this is a very, very serious issue. I'm not telling you to go out and insult people. I'm not telling you to beat up on people. The person that introduced me to all this, I told the story in Sunday school, introduced me to this, did it kindly and politely. You know what I would have done if he'd started yelling at me? I'd have yelled back, and I would have paid a bit of attention to what he said. Sorry, that's me. I'm not telling you to go out and tell you, you got a satanic Bible. 
why I'm telling you, in fact, not to do that. But I do want you to understand how serious this issue is and how clever Satan is in trying to mislead people. All across the world, we independent Baptist churches are supporting missionaries that are using, and they don't even know it, they're using Bibles based on Westcott and Horton. A church, he builds a church, and he doesn't even into heresy in the second generation when the missionary is gone. Many, many mission students have commented on this. I said, why? Because all those people have is a corrupt Bible. They didn't grow up with the training that you have or that you have around this church. Okay? This is serious, serious business. We have a very, very clever devil. And if you want to get the whole thing, read and understand the omni-gender movement of our day, just read Virginia Mollencott's book, Sensuous Spirituality, that puts it all in perspective. Graduate, prominent fundamentalist university, master's degree, taught in that university for years, taught in another fundamentalist university. I really, got, I had started this direction. I really got the whole picture where I'm reading J.B. Phillips' Spirit of Truth, a Ring of Truth. He called it Ring of Truth because when he was doing his translation, he, the way he translated it was how it rang true to him. He, he wasn't obligated to the words. It was how it rang true to him. And he told about the ghost of C.S. Lewis helping him. I'm saying this guy is accepted in evangelical preacher ranks. His Bible was once widely used. Are we no more discerning than that? Because here's what's happening. You need this Bible. It's new. Yeah, but where'd it come from? We need this Bible. It's easy. Why is it easy to understand? Not all Bible truth is easy to understand. Why is your Bible easy? Well, you need this Bible. It's popular. You need this Bible. It sounds just like the daily newspaper. Really? That's a qualification for a Bible? I uh, was pastoring in Chicago. Our family doctor was a member of the church. My wife had concerns. She went to the doctor. He ordered tests. It's a Wednesday afternoon. Get a call from the doctor's office. As the tests have come in, the doctor wants to meet with you and Cindy after the service tonight. Okay. He's one of those people... Some people, when you're preaching to them, you can't tell anything from their face. I mean, it's just uh, you don't know anything. But he's one of those people. You knew everything he was thinking. If he really liked what you just said, you could tell. If he didn't like what you just said, you could tell. And I got up to preach that Wednesday night, and he wouldn't look at me. He couldn't. He'd stare at the floor. He looked at the ceiling. And my heart jumped because I knew the news was going to be tough. He met with us afterward, told us that Cindy had cancer. She's been great. She's in remission. She's been in remission for 12 years. I mean, we glory that. But that night, he's got cancer. He said, this is pretty bad. He said, I want to schedule surgery for Friday. We go home. I'm trying to be the helpful, strong, supportive husband. It's as fake as it could possibly be, but that's what I'm trying to be. Finally, my wife goes to bed, and I'm sitting in the living room, and I just about fall apart. And there on the coffee table is a Chicago Tribune, which reads exactly like the daily newspaper, and a King James Bible. In my time of turmoil, which one do you think I went to? The last thing in the world I was interested in was something that read like the daily newspaper. I wanted something that read like the Word of God. Yeah, this is for us serious business. We have heads bowed and eyes closed if someone wanted to come and play. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray you'd work among our folks here. They're good folks. They've come. They've listened. They've evaluated. They've been a great audience to preach to on difficult topics. I just pray you'd stir in their hearts. 
Father, help them to grasp the importance of this and the seriousness of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you all stand with me? And, and as dear lady plays, if you want to come and pray, the altar's yours. God uses this moment to speak to your heart about salvation or about some other issue. Do not miss this moment if God's dealing in your heart. Praise the Lord. Um, you know, I was thinking um, when a guy is a, a drunk and he gets saved from being a drunk and he had a you know, destroyed life, when he's around alcohol um, and he looks at it, he knows what it is. Where somebody that really that doesn't know, they know it's bad, but they just don't know why. You know, they really don't understand what the drunk knows. And I feel like, uh, you know, after tonight, this week, you know, you know, like, yeah, we're King James, we believe in King James, but now when I, you know, when you see that, it's like, you know better what it is. Because most people, like you said, most people just don't, you know, it's, you know, it's what our church uses, it's easier to read. How many times have you heard that? It's just easier to read, you know, but, you know, um, so we need to pray for wisdom and, you know, when, when, when folks just, you know, if we can help them, uh, but at least strengthen us in that. Amen. So, well, hey, Brother Green, it's good to have you today. Amen. Both you guys. And uh, so we have a gift for you, Brother Green. For any pastor that comes, we have a gift and a, a candy bar. And uh, also, uh, if you'd like to get a book from the table, if he doesn't have it, if it's sold out, we'll get it to you. So, uh, good. Thank you for coming tonight. Amen. All right. Well, good, good, good. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, uh, we have one more. Night. Brother, Brother Chris, good to have you and Brenda with us tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good. Uh, we have one more night, and uh, man, it's been really good. A lot to take in, isn't it? So, all right, Hunter, would you uh, close us in prayer tonight, please? Okay. 